Fuck. <laughs> Hello, it's Loretta. Hello, it's JR. Hey, JR, how's it going? It's going. I would like to officially call to order the regular scheduled Community Services Commission meeting of March 3rd. Let the record reflect that the Commission Porter and Commissioner Rosenberg are teleconferencing. Correction, oh. not Commission Porter, uh, or Loretta Heron, excuse me. Due to the pandemic and pursuit to the governor's executive order, there are no members of the public present in the council chambers. We encourage residents to remain engaged and watch our proceeding from home through the city website. Pledge of Allegiance would be led by Chair Shear, myself, if we would stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag. To the flag. To the United States of America. To the Republic for which it stands. One nation. One nation. Under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Thank you.
I have a quick question to interject. Um, <clears throat> I looks like I'm online. I can see myself up in the corner, but I do not see the rest of the dais or anybody else. We will check that. Uh, have uh, Nick up in the skybox. He'll look and see if we get that camera feed for you to see. Thank you for letting okay. us know. This is the time in the agenda for presentation items, and Director Brett Channing will introduce these items. Thank you, Chair Heron, or <laughs> Chair Shear. Uh, our first item is to recognize our outgoing Chair Heron. We've now messed up her name twice tonight. Um, we, uh, we do this annually. Uh, as you know, we, we change our chairs um, each year uh, on a rotational basis and serve one year. So we are fortunate to have um, Loretta Heron as our chair for 2020, uh, one of the most unusual years in our history, and um, wanted to just read off her commendation that we have uh, for her tonight. Whereas Loretta Heron was selected by the City Council to serve on the Community Services Commission on March 2nd, 1999, and whereas Loretta Heron was selected to serve as the chairperson of the Lake Forest Parks and Recreation Commission on January 8th, 2020, and whereas in 2020, the Community Services Commission, under the leadership of Chairperson Heron, and the commission provided recommendations to the City Council for re a revision to the sports tournament policy, a revision to the hours of the Barker Ranch Dock Park, the city's use of Prop 68 per capita grant funds for future projects. Whereas Chairperson Heron guided the commission during the challenges brought forth with COVID-19 and also provided leadership with the opening of a new clubhouse, community center, and performing arts center. Now therefore, be it resolved that the city council of the city Lake Forest does hereby commend and congratulate Loretta Heron on an outstanding year as the city's Community Services Commission chairperson. So with that, on behalf of the city council and the whole commission as a whole, we'd like to thank uh, Loretta Heron for a great year of service. So thank you, do short applause. Well, thank you. I truly appreciate this. I didn't, I, I, I was very pleasantly surprised because I guess I forgot about it, but I, I truly, truly thank you guys. It means a lot to me. Absolutely, and we have a certificate for you signed by the council that we would give to you tonight, but um, not here, so we will be sending that to you in the mail. You know what? Why don't I, may I pick it up tomorrow morning? Uh, yes, you can. I'm getting the look of yes from uh, our clerk, so yes, if you want to come on well, by, Jennifer will be able to give it to you. Okay, because work asks that I bring, they want me to show it off at work, <laughs> so that's what I'll do. <laughs> good, good. Okay. Please do. Come on. There by. you are. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And then I can go right into the next item, if that's okay with you, Mr. Chair. All right. Our next presentation is a commendation for the prior Community Service Commissioner, Lisa Porter. And um, we have tonight uh, just a, a thank you and commending uh, Ms. Porter for her time uh, on this Community Services Commission. She decided not to uh, reapply after four years um, of great service, and, and we owe a lot to her for her input and um, feedback and impact that she had on the Community Services Commission um, over the past four years. And so her uh, commendation reads um, that the Commendation of the City Lake Forest Community Services Commission thanks and commends Lisa Porter for her dedicated service to the residents of the City Lake Forest during her tenure as the Community Services Commissioner from December 2016 through December of 2020. So although uh, we don't have anyone, we can't have anyone from the in the audience here, otherwise we would have invited uh, Ms. Porter back to congratulate her uh, we will be doing so virtually, and uh, we will be sending this commendation to her via mail as well. So 
even though she's not here. Again, another round of applause for Lisa for a great job on her time with the city. Yay! Okay, and then that leads into uh, the third item on our um, agenda for tonight, which is a community services staff program update. So, um, Commission, you may recall at our last meeting we had uh, the other we had our first half of uh, our community services staff present on what's been going on at the skate park and the uh, senior center, and so we have the other half of our great staff here from the community services department to talk about what's been going on at the sports park. So with that, I'm going to be introducing um, Bill Berry, our recreation supervisor, and Ken Sipes, our other recreation supervisor from the sports park. The computer went out its password. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Shear and fellow commissioners. My name is Bill Berry. I'm one of the recreation supervisors at the Lake Forest Sports Park and Recreation Center. Uh, I want to take the time to thank you guys for letting us give you this update and giving you the information throughout this pandemic that we've been going through and how we've been serving our community. But before I start, I wanted to give a special thanks to our community services department and how hard everybody's been working to get through these difficult times and to help our residents and to make sure that they're well educated and that we're still continuing to provide um, successful programming for them to be a part of. So thank you very much. So here's a short timeline. Uh, in March, on March 13th, 2020, um, we got the phone call that we had to close our recreation center, which meant we had to notify all of our part-time staff members in addition to that, we had to notify all of our participants and all of our contract instructors. So it was quite a task, um, but from there, we made it happen and we kept moving forward um, and it just kind of opened new doors for us to do, to challenge ourselves to do different programs. Um, on April 14th, our athletics fields closed. So following everything that we had just been through in March, now our athletic fields are closed April 14th, so we kind of went through the same exact process of notifying all of our group users, um, and then they have to notify all the participants. So it was quite a task in those early months. Um, fortunately, once we fast forward to the end of June, all the athletic fields were able to reopen for practices only, but we were able to kind of get back to some sort of normalcy, um, and that way the kids could get back out there and practice with their teams. Youth and adult sports games were allowed to resume this year on February 26th. Modified rules and regulations, um, but we were able to get different games and so forth going with, within their same team. So it was kind of a milestone for us to be able to get all the way from March 13th through Sorry about that. Uh, community education. This was something that was very important to us. Um, None of us had been through a pandemic like this, so we, haven't, we didn't have any training on here's what we're supposed to do. We just kind of figured it out. And staff began educating um, park users uh, regarding guidelines, um, you know, encouraging social distancing. So these are things that were all brand new to us, um, but our staff worked day in and day out to make sure that we were giving the proper information to the public uh, community members heavily, heavily utilized the parks. So when we went out to go check on all the different parks, we noticed that there was an increase in walkers and joggers um, and just overall park participation. Um, while most of our residents were out there wearing their masks, social distancing, uh, making sure that uh, you know they were walking on opposite sides of the road or the park or walkways. Um, and it was very encouraging to see and I saw it firsthand because I was out at a lot of those parks, um, you know, throughout the week. Um, in addition to that, uh, we did all of the other parks, well, about 30 of the other parks 
that we traveled to on a daily basis and we split those parks up between our full-time staff members and we went out and again it was about educating the public um, making sure that the playgrounds were closed when they needed to be um, and really just giving information um, to the public to keep them updated on what's going on I think that was one of the most important things that we've done is to give that education to them um, instead of you know not and leaving them in the dark so we were very very happy and successful with that uh, staff continues to the day to provide community uh, provide the community with updated state and local guidelines so for example we have people come all the time to the recreation center and it's closed and they may knock on the door um, you know we're not letting people in but if they have questions we answer them to the best of our ability and give them the information that they need or that they can bring back to their families um, so it's it, it works both ways there it's good for us to stay up on all of that education and then be able to give it out to the public so this kind of leads us into the summer months of 2020 virtual classes began so the quote that i oh, excuse me one second the quote that i put up there kind of struck me um, and i figured you know what i need to add this in the in there instead of thinking outside of the box why not get rid of the box so our goal here is it's, it's time for new programming. It's time to do new things. The times are changing. We haven't gone back to, to completely normal by any means. So this is where the Virtual Recreation Center came in. And we started adding classes to our website and showing different videos of things that people, people could do. Um, and then in addition to that, um, I started in July and August, our contract classes uh, became basically all virtual. And you can see there's examples up here there was etiquette classes for children, there's Girl Scout programs, guitar was uh, done virtually, fit camps, yoga, art, photography, even cheerleading. So it kind of shows you what we can do and how we can adapt to still serve the public. Uh, the platforms that were typically used through our contract instructors was YouTube and Zoom, and some of those classes were a very big hit um, and worked really well. This leads me into our contract classes. Now, we've returned to doing contract classes, but they must be outdoors. The recreation center is still closed. With these classes, if you can see the photos in the top left-hand corner, that's our adult Zumba class, and they're under the awning at the Lake Forest Sports Park. I mean, how great is it for people to walk by, and they do, and say, what's going on? What's happening? Who is, what are they doing? Well, it's a Zumba class. If you're interested in registering, you know, Check online and you can register for the class. The top right is one of our youth uh, camps, which is a bio nerds class, loved by the kids, ton of fun. They practice social distancing. You can see all of the instructors wearing masks. Um, so everybody seems to be following these guidelines and adapting to these different rules and regulations at the same time. The very bottom one happens to be one of my favorites. This is the three to four year old uh, ballet class, huge. It's very popular and it's outside right above the common grass at the sports park. The parents all sit around socially distanced, they wear their masks and the kids are out here having a great time. So we're still able to run these different types of programs. Um, our, you know, like I said, our instructors quickly adapt to running the outdoor classes. Um, it took a little bit to get them used to from being inside the building to moving outdoors, but we've done a pretty good job um, and registration is continuing to rise. Um, all of the classes we offer are for youth and adults. So every, everybody from you know, zero all the way up, music together is zero to four years old, and then we've got Zumba where we are up in the 70s and 80s. So um, there's classes for everybody. Uh, to speak of that, January and February, uh, we had two pretty big months as far as contract classes go. Our revenue was approximately $21,000, um, and that's just based off of outdoor classes. So that kind of shows you how we've uh, began to expand our classes and so forth. And now I'm going to turn it over to Recreation Supervisor Ken Sipes to give you an update further. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. Ken Sipes, Recreation Supervisor. Glad to be back. Uh, Bill and I were here back uh, in June. What was that, eight months ago? Um, seems like forever ago. A lot has happened since then. 
So um, I'll c continue on with a few of the slides and then Bill will be back. Um, one of the things that um, I included in our presentation for today was kind of some uh, behind the scenes uh, type activities that took place uh, since we've been closed due to COVID. Um, obviously everyone knows about the fires that we had. Um, those uh, directly affected um, our athletic sports fields. Um, we even had some rain in between um, the fires. And so uh, all our field users that were out there um, anxious to get back out on the fields because at that time um, we just kind of uh, had to open back up for practices. Um, we dealt with the fires and the smoke there. Um, Bill and I, uh, we held the fort down there at the recreation center. Um, on the first fire, I remember getting there at 8, and then I left at midnight uh, later that night, and I took that picture there and um, cruised around on the golf cart just to make sure everything was good. And then um, uh, Bill actually, during the fires, uh, two different occasions, spent the night over at El Toro High School and, and worked through the night. So we were very busy uh, being involved with that. Uh, we also had election day, and we had that ballot. Uh, we have that ballot box out there on site at the sports park. And um, one of the things that I found interesting leading up to the election was how many people that showed up to the rec center, even though it was closed. And many, many times, uh, if I was walking out to get in the golf cart and do a round at the park or head out to lunch. Um, individuals from the community were coming up for, uh, to the front doors asking for information about where they were going to be voting. And as early as four to six weeks before the election, we had individuals that weren't used to the sports park that were coming up and they just wanted to get the lay of the land. I remember one lady said, um, uh, actually my husband sent me on this little adventure because I think he wanted me out of the house. So. Um, we had election day, and also um, the later part of uh, last year, we um, hired a paint crew. They were awesome um, with the history, uh, myself and construction management a few years back. Um, I know how hard uh, painting is on large facilities like this, and these guys did an excellent job. So um, that also took place. Forgot about the clicker. One of the other activities that we've had uh, several different times in, in the large activity rooms is um, some blood drives. And the city partner with American Red Cross to uh, host several of these blood drives. I think we've had five there now. Um, each blood drive had over, um, I would personally ask how many um, restorations they had, which was typically in the high 50s. and the. Uh, the show up rate was about fi uh, 50 plus, uh, anywhere between 50 and, and 55 uh, donors would show up. And that um, calculation came out to a potentially saving 150 lives. Now, on a personal note, I wanted to add for the first time ever, the last donation that took place, I gave blood for the first time in my life. Um, I did not even know what blood type I was. And it just so happens, um, I've already registered for the next one that's coming up in the first of April. And I received an email yesterday from the Red Cross, and it said that my blood was on a, the way out to Ontario, California, to a hospital for someone that was in need of the blood that I donated. So that was pretty cool. I'm going to turn it back over to Bill. I'll be back. Thank you, Ken. So I'm going to cover the next two slides, and these are kind of two of my favorite slides that, uh, that have been part of this presentation. The first one is the Sports Park Food Drive. The city partnered with uh, Saddleback Church to host a food drive in our parking lot, uh, one of the most well-organized events I've ever seen. Um, and as you can see in the photos here, you know, over 335 families were served through this drive through uh, food drive, which is a total of about 1,200 people. So uh, it's a very huge accomplishment. And, you know, I kind of sat back and watched the people drive through. And, you know, you, looking inside the cars, you could see how appreciative these people were um, to be receiving the amount of food that they did. Um, it kind of it kind of took me back a little bit. And, you know, one of the one of the biggest things is that there is one single staff member from Saddleback Church that organizes this with 49 volunteers. So it's not like they have 
a ton of regular full-time staff that are out there doing these things. They have, an, they have a coordinator, basically, and then they end up with 49 volunteers who put this whole entire thing together um, and you know, serve needy families that are, that are in need. Uh, the other one is the special needs um, PPE distribution. We just had this February 26th. Um, we've had a few in the past as well. Um, I was fortunate enough to be out there for that one as well. And there was a line of cars coming through the sports park roundabout, and they served approximately 300 cars. And, you know, some of the park patrons came walking by and would ask, what, what are you guys doing? Well, this is a PPE distribution um, for special needs. And we got nothing but compliments. People were very, very complimentary on, you know, what we were doing and taking the time to make sure that you know everybody has PPE equipment. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn this back over to Ken to talk about youth sports. All right, let's talk about some um, sports. Uh, with the uh, pandemic and COVID um, coming into place, uh, I can honestly say in the 25 years that I've been doing sports-related programming and and um, activities and scheduling fields. Um, one would think that because the Rector Center was closed, that Bill and I were just kicking back. Um, I can tell you that I've never been busier on a daily basis having to decipher all the different guidelines and communi communicating that to our local sports groups. Um, it, it was uh, a big task, but I was excited to come to work every day and thankful um, that I, I, I was uh, working at that beautiful facility every day. And um, so I want to talk a little bit about the timeline and what took place over the course of the last year. As Bill had mentioned earlier, the Spork Park Fields closed on April 14th. And then we um, got some new guidance from the state and reopened um, some of the fields uh, for practice only at the end of June. And that actually took place um, only on the turf fields, uh, the artificial turf fields A and B over at the sports park. Uh, that's what we started off with as kind of a um, soft reopening of the fields. And then in September, practices resumed on all fields. And then that's when some rain came into play and everyone was super fired up to be back out on the fields, at least getting out there, kicking the ball around, throwing the ball around. And we had some rain and the fires and the field closures due to the air quality. And then in November, I had the winter field allocation meeting, not knowing what the heck was going to happen in the coming months. Um, but I uh, hosted that meeting on Zoom, and that was the first uh, Zoom-type meeting that I've had done for a field allocation or any kind of uh, sports-related uh, uh, program. And the participation was more than I've ever had. Um, everyone knows how hard it is to get to a, um, any kind of meeting in the evening, as we are here tonight, um, and having that on Zoom. It was just another indication that we could uh, work with the times and um, I honestly think that moving forward that most likely I will be um, hosting the allocation meetings via Zoom because the participation was about four times what I usually get in person. And um, I also had a special guest, um, Jim was, um, C uh, Commissioner Jim was at uh, on that video call and um, so he was a friendly face to see out there when I was telling everyone what was going on. Uh, practices only continued through uh, last month, uh, January. Um, I guess we're in March now, time flies. And then um, just recently in the last couple of weeks we re uh, received some updated guidance on February 19th and that allowed for games to resume, as uh, Bill mentioned. Um, there's not too many games uh, starting out there yet. Uh, all the organizations that I work with are scrambling, trying to figure this out, get um, schedules put together, uh, teams put together, um, officials, and everything that comes along with uh, organizing and, and scheduling sports. So most groups um, are starting here in, uh, next week. Uh, or the week after into um, the beginning and in, in middle of April. So everyone's kind of taking their time, seeing how the um, everything plays out with uh, the current current status of, of COVID and, and um, the percentages that we have here in Orange County. Uh, the games may resume, but not tournaments. So no tournaments yet. 
spectators can be there, but immediate family only. Uh, we're asking that uh, the face coverings by the coaches, officials, and sideline players when they're not in the game wear their masks. Uh, there are travel restrictions that uh, teams should not travel outside the county to play or uh, outside the state. And um, one, uh, one of the items that came out in the latest guidance was uh, something that was a little bit new. Uh, there was some stipulations on there in, res uh, in respects to the informed consent, uh, which we uh, developed a waiver form um, off of what we had done uh, about a year ago and asked all the groups uh, to sign one of those uh, covering all the guidelines that I just mentioned above. Um, I've all, we've, we've also requested that each organization put together their own guidelines based off of the latest update from the CDPH, uh, and um, those are coming in uh, day by day. And I also wanted to mention um, what, what, what's been happening with uh, NJB. Um, they've worked with what we had. We have two wonderful, beautiful outdoor courts there at the sports park, and they've been running practices on um, outdoors on Wednesdays and Saturdays for the last few months. Um, so they're anxious to get back into the gym. Um, the pictures that I have noted here, uh, actually in the, um, the lower one there is our, one of our Skyhawks Hoopster Tots uh, classes, and those have been running for the last two seasons. And um, as you can see, there, um, that's uh, Coach Jerry. He's probably one of the best like, recreational uh, younger kid instructors that I've ever seen. He's very enthusiastic, and he's um, got many different um, activities that he goes over where the kids are spread out. And um, the, the photo above is um, one of the first uh, pictures that I took when the kids got back out on the fields, and is you can't really see in the picture, but the little green cones, they're numbered. So each um, player had their backpack and their water bottle and their ball um, at each of those cones. And as you can see, they're taking a little break and getting some hydration. All right, well, um, with everything and all the craziness uh, that's been going on um, out at the sports park, Bill and I have been Bill introduced I, to a couple different uh, newer type activities and, and organizations, um, and I'll talk about those. Uh, in January uh, of this year, we have a total of t uh, 28 club and travel ball groups uh, practicing, trading, taking place every week with about 8,500 athletes out there on a weekly basis. Um, rev uh, one thing I wanted to note that for field allocations and field permits, the revenue since COVID has started um, is just over $90,000. And uh, our projected revenue for the first half of uh, 21, uh, 2021 is this first allocation period, January through June of this year, is um, approximately $115,000. Um, I also wanted to note um, I'm in direct communication with one of our contracts, uh, Friday Night Lights. They provide uh, flag football for our youth here in Lake Forest and surrounding cities. And um, Keith, uh, the organizer of uh, FNL, informed me yesterday that uh, they have 750 signups last week. I uh, recommended to him that he should put a cap on it at 750, and he did. And he informed me that they have 60 uh, children on the wait list. So that's over 800 um, kids that want to get back out there on the field and play flag football. Um, with those signups for this spring season, um, they are planning on having a coaches meeting uh, next week on Zoom. I'll be a participant on that. And then they'll put the, the teams together with games uh, potentially starting in uh, the middle of April. And that will bring into the city um, approximate revenue of about $40,000. Now, with all of this and, and adjusting to how um, COVID has affected uh, sports and the use of our athletic fields, I've had a few different groups that have come out of this. Um, we had a private school contact me right at the beginning of COVID, and it's called the Togethership. It's in here in Lake Forest, and those individuals came to me and said, hey, we're opening up a new private school, and um, our, our uh, students will do athletics and sports, 
and training in the morning and then education-based uh, classroom activities in the afternoon at their facility that was right up the road from the sports park. So that, that was something that started popping up was pri uh, some private schools, smaller ones, um, that wanted to, to use our facilities. And um, that was just uh, one of them. Uh, right above that, uh, Rep One Sports came to me in late December. They are a huge sports agency um, that actually, uh, I think it was back in 2005, branched off from Lee Steinberg. He was one of the biggest uh, sports agents um, in the, the, the sporting world. Um, they branched, two brothers branched off, and they contacted me to see if they could um, move and migrate from the Great Park over to our facility at the sports park. And so we welcomed them, uh, met with them over the phone and on um, video conferencing. And what they wanted to do is uh, share a couple hours in the morning for um, future NFL um, athletes to come out and train. And that, that's who is pictured in those um, pictures there up in the upper left. Those are all um, football players that are training for, they were hoping to have the combine, uh, which got canceled this last week. Um, but now they're training for pro day. So they have about 12 athletes out there in the morning from 8 a.m. to 10.30 in the morning, and they're out there training, pulling sleds, um, doing sprints, being timed. Um, so that's pretty cool. We actually, uh, after this slide, have a video um, that I'd like to share that was done by their marketing team. Um, also, that's, what's come out of this is a lot of club teams have uh, contacted me. Um, thankfully, one of the things that I put together uh, <clears throat> when I came on board here is a field matrix, and um, I, I, I run our athletic field allocations like a business, and I'm doing everything I can to uh, bring in as much revenue as possible to, to the city, and what I do with that field matrix is uh, send that out to groups that are uh, contacting me that are looking for field space, and then they can look at what we have um, that's booked and reserved for our uh, current uh, field users and then look at, see if there's any openings for their groups. And on top of that, uh, with the changes that we've had in the last couple of weeks with the state, um, a lot of you know that CIF is getting back after it and they've got their seasons going um, all at once. Uh, football and uh, baseball, lacrosse, soccer, they're all going. Um, at once, so I'm getting a lot of overflow from Tribugo Holes High School, um, El Toro High School, and um, Santa Margarita have contacted me, and they started using our fields about a week and a half ago um, in the afternoons from 2 to 4 p.m., so our facility is, is, is very busy all the time. All right, let's talk a little bit about adult sports. Um, so in February, we started our winter season in 2020. Um, and that got put on hold. Uh, March 13th, uh, all city programs were suspended, as Bill mentioned. And that, um, th this timeline, when I was putting this together, I'm like, holy cow, look at all these different changes that we had. And, and um, a saying my dad always says is, um, hurry up and wait. That's what I felt like as I was putting this together. Uh, <clears throat> we suspended our adult sports programs through the end of March. And in the middle of March, we suspended them through the end of April. And then um, leagues were postponed until the end of May. And then um, we ended up uh, canceling in April, the end of April, when our leagues were canceled and we prorated refunds, which was very fun. Vicki helped me out with uh, about 100 of those that we had. And um, the, the, the winter season was finally canceled. <clears throat> with the latest CDPH updates, adult sports can re uh, return to play. And what I've uh, put together um, as a staff, we discussed this thoroughly for about three or four days, even though we were getting about, uh, I don't even want to tell you how many emails from all our adult sports um, participants were wondering when the next season was going to be, once they heard about the latest update. And um, we decided to um, go along with our current magazine schedule. We didn't want to jump the gun. Um, and we did a lot of research with uh, surrounding cities. Uh, there are one or two cities that I know of that are trying to get a season to start in April. Um, it's not a for sure thing. So we as a team uh, decided to uh, go along with the magazine schedule and have registration in May with the first uh, reopening kickoff season after COVID um, starting in June or July. Um, that allows us time to see how everything plays out with our numbers. The last thing we want to do is start a season in April and then shut it down. 
So that's what we looked at. Um, in regards to adult basketball, um, I haven't had too many uh, basketball participants contact me, but they were part of my email um, stream that I sent out uh, last week and let them know that um, we haven't determined when we'll be able to have indoor basketball any anytime soon, hopefully um, in the fall. But um, all our participants are very anxious. Uh, majority of them are very um, thoughtful in the responses that I got um, from them saying, hey, thanks for the update, and we're get, we'll be ready when, when everyone else is ready. So that's my update for adult sports and uh, youth sports programs. I do want to uh, jump back to the Rep 1 sports agency that I spoke about. They had a marketing team out the field doing some um, filming of the participants, uh, the video I'm going to show you now is about three minutes long, and um, the person that's mic'd up is uh, ex-wide receiver Ricky Prohl, and he's been out there every day, very enthusiastic. Um, we like to go out on the golf cart and kind of watch these guys train a little bit, but um, this is Ricky Prohl's mic'd up edition out at uh, our sports facility on Turf Field A. Moving your elbows, you're not just going like this. Beating the ground, just getting that relaxed. You want to relax your muscles where you're not tense. Let's go out route. Nice job, JB. Don't round it, don't round it. You got to sit down more. You're going to round it if you're not in a position 90 degree. Nice job, Dags. Atta boy. Good job, JB. Drop it. Feel the difference on that first one, Dax? You get top heavy, you don't sink those hips, you're going to roll forward. Sink those hips. Keep that chest down. Keep that chest down. There you go. Try to keep your pace the same right there. Get out. Atta boy. Good job, Dax. I don't want you to get where you hyperextend. You know, you don't want to extend where your straight leg. Just come in here and absorb. Good, good. Don't turn. Push. Nice catch. Don't turn your foot and go like that. Push off the outside of your plant leg, okay? That outside foot. Step to it, too. If you're going to step outside, bring your chest with it so you can uh, load to explode, okay? Good, good. Ball. There you go. Nice. Good job, JB. Same footwork, but now you, a lot of you did it there. You're crossing face, but here you're just breaking out. Four to six, okay? Ball. Snack. Ball. Yeah. Ball. Good, Dax. And we'll get into it further down, but a one by three. Like a nub, we're at some, yeah. That strong safety be outside, you'll be in a tight, he'll be outside, you may even go. Instead of like what we're doing right now, you would be, your angle would be more to that cone. And we'll get into that, we'll start doing that, because then you'll start, we'll do bang eights off it, we'll do seams off it. Okay. Same thing, smooth. This time, what I want you to really focus on is head still, stay in that lean. Head stay still, right here, and then when you plant that left foot, just accelerate that arm pump. Pedal, pedal through the break. Set. Get up. Nice catch, nice catch. Ball. There you go. Good, good. Pedal through it, square up. Give me that back shoulder to me. Ball. There you go. Good job. Nice job, J3. Take that spray release, get vertical. That's going to help your footwork. That'll help you in the transition to when you speed cut at the top. I promise you, it's going to make it a lot easier. Anyway, that was just a little example of what's been taking place since the uh, beginning of January in the mornings out on our fields. 
Um, pretty cool. Uh, there was a, also another video that they shared with us. Joe Staley from the 49ers was one of the trainers out on the fields. And um, now that the NFL season's over, there's actually a few other pro players that have been out there. Um, and uh, so we adjusted and we had this opportunity to work with Rep One. And it sounds like to me that they want to continue that um, into the future. So um, that's our presentation and talking about uh, the Recreation Center and youth and adult sports. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, Ken, this is Jim. Um, a couple. Number one, you mentioned the revenue figures, which are, in my opinion, very impressive. What is it compared to the revenue we had prior to COVID uh, from the permits? Well, prior to COVID, um, we didn't have as much field availability because of our adult sports softball program. So um, our increase in revenue is because we don't have those programs. And that was part of the reason why we held off on having our next adult slow pitch league in June or July because of our field permits that are currently in place with our youth sports organizations through the end of June. So that would be the biggest attribute because we had more field available. Okay. And then the, the other kind of a comment, um, the ref one, it's, it's an impressive thing to, you know, have as a label for less what we normally would say a, a municipal facility um, hosting professional class athletes for, for training programs. Um, is that video also available on, let's say, uh, one of the city websites or social media platforms? Uh, Chair Rosenberg, this is Laura. Um, at, currently, we have not uploaded that to any website at this point because we did want to vet that through the city manager's office. But we did get quite a few videos and quite a few photos from Rep. One um, in re in regards to to the facility that they've been using. And and like I said, like Ken mentioned earlier, they're super pleased to be at the sports park and and actually paid us quite the compliment of telling us that so much nicer than the Great Park. <laughs> but it is something that I would like to vet through the um, city manager's office and see if we can upload one of those videos to the website, because I think it would be great um, marketing for, for the sports park. It's, it, oh, yeah. it's, it makes the sports park look like yeah. some, some other place. I mean, I, the sports park's amazing, but it looks like, wow. Yeah. What, do you see uh, like a, a roadblock in doing that or a hurdle or? N no, it's just something that was really just given to us recently. Um, and, and Ken and I wanted to put that in this presentation immediately um, without really permission from, yeah. from anybody else. We just did it. So, so it needs to kind of go up the chain of command just to get the, the sign sealed, delivered approval, and then, and then we'll get that going. I also want to check with Rep. One to yeah. make sure yeah. they're okay. With yeah, we, we should all well, check with them. Yeah, you would, you'd have to get uh, their blessing in doing it as well. But like you just said, from the city standpoint, it's a great marketing tool. It's a great, again, tool for the city and what we're accomplishing with our facility. Um, and, uh, you know, there's Call it this way, there's fans all over. And uh, I, I know for a fact that a lot of fans in the off season, if there's a local training facility where they can see professional athletes, they would not hesitate to, you know, come by. Um, I, I just think it would be a great, great thing, once again, to publicize the sports park as a facility. And I would highly recommend that we look at doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Bill or myself? Great job, guys. Phenomenal job. Walk proudly. Thank you, and um, everyone have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you.
We have reached the public comment section of our agenda. Until further notice, we encourage members of the public to submit their comments via email or voicemail. Email address is cscommission at lakeforestca.gov. Or voicemail, which is preferred by calling area code 949-461-3509. Uh, email comments will not be read at the meetings. Voicemail messages, however, will be played at the meeting and will be limited to three minutes per speaker. To ensure staff reviews the comments prior to the meeting, please submit email or voicemail comments by 5 p.m. on the day of the meeting. Comments reached after the time will be uploaded to the agenda packet and made part of the official public record of the meeting. Madam Commissioner Secretary, do we have any email, voicemail messages at this particular point in time intended for public comment? We do have one public comment that we'll play for you now. Joining the meeting. Uh, public comment. Um, my name is Mark Ryan. Uh, I just wanted to let you know we're very pleased over here at Bennett Ranch with the Cherry Park. Um, they've taken the uh, metal fencing down as of yesterday, and the kids are enjoying it. Uh, just a fantastic improvement in what we had. Just want to let you know, kudos to the City of Lake Forest. Thank you much. Bye-bye. Thank you. We will move forward to the consent calendar. And we have one item, item four minutes of the regular meeting conducted on February 3rd. Is there any uh, discussion or comment before we move to a vote for acceptance of minutes? If not, the chair will entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Is there a second? A second. All those in favor on um, voice vote, say aye. 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 Very good. Minutes have been. Aye. Oh, very good. Minutes have been accepted as recorded. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move forward to discussion items. At this time, we would have Director Brett Channing to introduce these items. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Chair Shear. Um, for the first item is our uh, February 2020 recreation report, and I'm going to hand it over to our two recreation managers, Vicki Bluffin and Laura Lisak. Good evening, Chair Shear and fellow commissioners. I will discuss in brief review of the events that took place for the month of February. As you can see in your first uh, picture here, we had two different food distribution um, events that went on with the assistance of the PIO's office along with uh, partnering with Saddleback Church. As Bill mentioned, we had the first one, which was held the second Tuesday of the month at the sports park, and he went over those numbers with you. We also had one the third Tuesday of the month, and that was held at Heroes Park. So the thought in mind with Saddleback Church partnering with the city is that we are going to try to attract two different types of populations from the city, both in um, the area of Foothill Ranch and then also in the area of Lower Lake Forest near um, Heroes Park and El Toro Park and those residents over there. We had quite a bit of a success at that area as well. They had over 306 cars come through, with averaging um, a total of 1,000 families that would be felt, uh, fed. Um, again, that same staff person uh, leads that group with volunteers, and it's solely based on volunteer help that's able to distribute all that food that comes from um, uh, centers such as South County Outreach and other uh, grocery stores and things like that. So they're able to give that food to Saddleback Church and in turn uh, redistribute it to those in need. 
Um, just a brief highlight, uh, Bill and Ken both included, um, we have all their information regarding their contract classes and the sports programs that have continued to go on during the month of February. Our, the month of February is really picking up and you can see um, now with the winter months kind of behind us, we're moving into the spring and having much more success with our attendance. Um, you will start seeing an increase as hopefully we turn this corner in the next couple weeks and start moving inside and bringing our contract classes indoors. But successfully, we've been able to still attract a good amount of participation with our groups outside. Um, our, our instructors have been willing to stay outside and finding that people are willing to um, endure the cold weather um, and um, still signing up for those classes. So it's very, it's very successful and very nice to see that we're still having that success. And moving, moving towards that spring, we're looking even more towards a higher um, registration rate. I'll turn it over to Vicki with the rest of her section. Thank you. So um, leading, on, or leading off of what Laura was saying in regards to registration, um, the spring recreation portion of the leaflet was in, was in homes at the end of January with registration for our spring programs taking place in mid-February. So we'll start to see our numbers go back up because of um, the new registration process uh, for, this, for the spring season. Um, in regards to the programs that I oversee, just a couple of highlights. We did our very popular PPE drive-through event for our 50 and better population. We had about 160 patrons come through the drive-through here out in the circular area and get a Valentine uh, themed PPE box that had a mask in it. We did a cookie for them, some hand sanitizer, and then uh, we always put a cute little note in there. And it's it's uh, obviously it's great to do the PPE. They all need that, but it's also a good way for them to get out and for us to see our normal patrons that we don't get to see on an ongoing basis now. Uh, the other highlight uh, for that population is our book club, which would normally take place at the clubhouse, has now gone virtual. One, and actually, the numbers for that uh, program have increased to 28 participants. This last round of book club, they were fortunate enough to not only have such a great turnout, but they had the author of the book that they've been reading. Elizabeth Letts is the author, was part of their Zoom um, Zoom club meeting about the book that they were overseeing. So that was very exciting for them. We continue to have great numbers in regards to our virtual programs, uh, not just our bingo, but our coffee with the clubhouse where the uh, conversation um, regard is uh, surrounding what's going on in um, current events and uh, just, just a time for them to socialize, it's, which is a huge part of our program. Um, we continue to have lots of phone calls in regards to our, our tax aid, which unfortunately because of COVID we, would, we are not able to do here physically, but are working with United Way to offer other solutions throughout Orange County for free tax um, preparation going on. And then lots of, uh, of inquiries and phone calls about vaccinations, um, where, where they can get the vaccination, how do they sign up for the vaccination. So uh, continue to do a lot of phone calls in regards to that. The numbers at the skate park continue to be strong uh, during COVID. We are continuing to have our 50 skaters per session, uh, and which is working out great. Um, in regards to the beginning of January, I know we're talking about February, but in January we have a big push to get all of our new waivers signed, which is a lot, a lot of paperwork for the staff. We're looking at 100 to 200 waivers a day that they're organizing. Uh, the Having the reservation system where 50 were coming at a time, we figured, hey, this is working so well, even at post-COVID, we might keep to that during that time period to help with the um, onslaught of paperwork that comes in for, for staff. Um, so those are the highlights that I have for my particular areas, and Laura and I are definitely here if you'd like to um, have, any, have any questions on any of this or any of the other programs that, we've, uh, that you can think of. Thank you. Um, uh, Commissioner Chair, may I ask? Yes, yes. Um, hi, Laura, uh, as you know, um, Oh, I was involved for many years on the <clears throat> parade committee, and um, one year with you, and uh, and you stepped in and did a great job. It was a tough thing to walk in the middle of. It was a great job that first year. Um, if I remember, the parade, the first parade committee meetings, and the, it was canceled this in 2020, start in February. What is, 
it looking like, because I don't know if, if, you, if you don't get it started by February as norm, um, is, is there kind of any idea if, if that's going to happen in 2021, Fourth of July parade? I'm sorry if I wasn't clear. Fourth of July parade, sorry. Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, we are still evaluating that. Uh, as you mentioned, we typically have, have already started the process for the 4th of July parade. Uh, so the later we get into this um, season, the less likely that it's going to be that we have the parade. Um, we still haven't completely made that decision yet uh, or made it known publicly. Um, but we are still evaluating. I think um, you know, it will be known here uh, in the near future. Uh, what's going to happen. We have been in communication with the committee, typical committee participants, letting them know that it's very unlikely that there's going to be a parade and we're not meeting at the moment. Um, but we haven't really made that announcement publicly uh, to the residents yet. So the decision is still not completely finaled. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Any further comment or questions? Thank you. Excellent feedback. Moving forward to director comments, does staff have any comments that they would like to present at this time? Commissioner Shear, I actually yes. believe we have one more um, discussion item for tonight. Oh, I apologize. Yes, I skipped over uh, uh, the item number six, uh, 30th anniversary celebration. That's correct. Thank you. Um, for this item, I'd like to invite our Senior Communications and Marketing Analyst, Jonathan Volsky, who has a presentation for you. And um, I would like to say that this item uh, was brought up at our last meeting um, by Commissioner Rosenberg as something that we wanted to bring to the Commission for some feedback uh, with regards to our 30th anniversary. Good evening, Commissioner Shear. I'm sorry, Chairman Shear, Commissioners. As Brett said, Jonathan Volsky, Senior Communications and Marketing Analyst. And our division is taking the lead on the 30th anniversary celebration, although we're certainly uh, working with the rest of the city for this great event. I'll give you a quick overview and then look forward to a discussion and maybe some suggestions from the committee. So as many of you know, if not all of you, of course, Lake Forest residents approved the incorporation in 1991. It was a two to one margin. And then that's also when they infamously selected Lake Forest over El Toro and uh, Rancho Canada for the names. We know that our Lake Forest residents value the area's history, but there's been a lot of new residents since 2000. Uh, not only did we have the incorporations then, but our annual survey or biannual survey that the city does shows that most residents have been here less than 15 years. So our campaign this year We'll celebrate the area's history. We hope to educate residents about the history, and then through that education, we'll bring people together and create a better sense of community. We started by creating in-house an anniversary logo. The uh, highlights of the logo are the clock tower of our new Civic Center. The city's worked with residents for 20 years to develop the plans for this Civic Center, and it's always been intended to be sort of the community's home, the 100-year home. So we thought it was appropriate for the 30th anniversary of cityhood. We hope to continue to use this as a logo after this year is finished. We'll drop the 30 years of cityhood banner and uh, use the line drawing. So thus far in our celebration, uh, the leaflet, the last issue of the leaflet you may have noticed, the cover story of course featured Heritage Hill and the history of the city along with a great timeline on some of the key points throughout the year, or throughout the 30 years. We've created a web page at lakeforestca.gov slash 30th anniversary, and that page features some fun things, the 30 interesting facts about Lake Forest, 30 reasons to love Lake Forest. We've got this great story map there, so rather than a static timeline, you can actually scroll through and see pictures that sort of tell the story, not only of the city, but even before the city, of course. And then we have an area for resident submissions, and we really hope it becomes interactive where people share their memories of Lake Forest, whether they're memories from last year or from 50 years ago. We've got promotional items that we just received and started giving out. Obviously, this is limited by the pandemic. We don't have our national night out and some of our other great events, the concerts in the park, where we could normally 
hand these out to people and celebrate. Uh, we did give them out last Saturday at a pop-up city hall in uh, Portola Hills with Councilman Serbo, and we'll give them out at other events as available. And of course, we have some here for you tonight. But we have the new city pin, the 30th anniversary pin, and then we have some other pins. So we went with pins and pins. So as I said, our, our goal is to educate and unite the residents, doing a lot with the leaflet. We plan to launch a series of podcasts this year, which would interview uh, some of the early city leaders uh, and be able to tell their stories, not just orally, but also with some video, because we, as you may know, have a TV station that will be launching here in less than a month. That'll give us not only a chance to show some videos, but also we'll have some bulletin board where we can slide some of those facts about Lake Forest across and some of the uh, interesting things, the reasons to love Lake Forest. So that concludes my presentation. I'd love to get your feedback and any suggestions you have on things we can do. Uh, we're hoping that by the end of the year, we'll be actually able to have a celebration, perhaps here at the Civic Center, maybe tied in with another holiday um, and involve the public even more. Um, Chair Scherer, I had a question for Jonathan, if I may. Um, hey, Jonathan, thank you so much. Uh, I remember talking about this when I first came on the commission, but it was way before the COVID started. And I think it possibly right now, because in speaking about the 4th of July parade, which is not going to happen, it might work out perfectly because the actual anniversary is December 20th, 1991. So I know on the 20th, you know, we did it right around that time. So it might be able to work out. Um, and I think if we got a lot of people together, we could pull it together. We have so many great volunteers here in Lake Forest. And um, another, so I'm hoping, you know, if now uh, being on the commission, because I served on a lot of, you know, volunteer things, uh, Director Channing, being a, a commissioner, are we still allowed to serve on things like parade committees and, um, you know, because I served on the 20th anniversary uh, celebration. Absolutely. There's yeah. no restrictions. Okay, great. Um, hoping to maybe join the parade committee again. Yay. Um, let's see. Oh, and another question is, I, I'm sorry if I misunderstood, is that logo with the clock tower and kind of, is that replacing the this one, this logo that we've had, or is that just for the 30th, this, with this year? It would sorry, actually would be an addition. So many cities have a formal seal, which yeah. is what that would be, and then they have a logo that is used still on letterhead and other documents and other marketing materials, but the seal will always remain. Uh, the city's obviously got a great investment in that seal. Residents are familiar with it. So it'll always remember, remain as the official seal while this logo would be used for marketing and other purposes. Okay, thank you very much. And like I said, if you start organizing this, either Laura, Vicki, or yourself, or Director Channing, count me in to help on the celebration. Committee. We'll rely on this entire committee because of the <laughs> expertise and the history. Oh, yeah. Okay. that you guys have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh... Chairman, further, sir, um, Victor, can you hear me? Yes. You can? Yes. Okay, because somehow the computer connection and I are at odds with each other during this meeting, but I've been listening on, on, um, on, on the phone um, to go back with the, I was trying to get a comment in real quickly to uh, Commissioner Matzel's bringing up the 4th of July parade, um, which to me would be a biggie to be able to do it in our 30th anniversary. But um, I, I think the key thing we have to make a decision on is when is the drop dead date on that, and which mainly is the purvey of staff to do because otherwise we're going to keep extending, 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 which will not give us the appropriate time to put forth the effort to put forth a good product. So I would like to really encourage commissioner, um, deputy city manager Channing to take the lead on coming up with a drop dead date. Um, let's say maybe April or something, after which point we make a formal decision, yes or no. Would that be appropriate? 
Yeah, ab absolutely. We we do kind of have that drop dead date internally. Um, it was around this time, the beginning of March. So we are have pretty much approached that drop dead date from an internal standpoint. However, we have not had that discussion with the city council or the city manager. So um, I think that would be the next step. So uh, expect uh, an announcement here in the very near future. Great, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, on the the hope that this year will allow us to come out of the pandemic state um, and hopefully do something, I would like us to maybe consider looking at a more of a end of the year event which is appropriate because our anniversary is at that time. I think everything that uh, Jonathan has presented uh, with podcasts, social media, um, different involvement um, by virtual means of previous leadership, the history of the city, et cetera, uh, makes perfect sense and is a great way to expose and celebrate the anniversary, but I still think there is no substitute by having some kind of a public gathering uh, towards maybe the fourth quarter um, when hopefully the standards will be somewhat more relaxed that could involve more people, more participation by residents from the city, either at our community center, the civic center, a sports park, or something where, again, we can involve thousands as opposed to just maybe hundreds or a smaller amount. Um, we had, previously we had um, a carnival, one of the major anniversaries uh, I would like to think about maybe revisiting that type of an event because we drew very, very well from the population of Lake Forest. And um, the only thing, of course, it's the weather type thing. It's winter. Um, but what they all say, it never rains in Southern California, except for like days like today. Uh, but um, maybe that would be something, you know, to consider to be able to do get a lot of different groups from the city. I know the chamber would be very willing to participate in that. Um, if we did something on that kind of a, of a scale as we did, and I want to say it was the 20th, the 20th anniversary uh, committee that we did that. I would also like to extend my services. I was on the committee for the 15th, the 20th, and the 25th um, to volunteer to be part of the committee on if we do something, which I think we should for the 30th anniversary. Thank you. <laughs> if, if I may, uh, thank you, um, Commissioner Rosenberg. And and kind of that, that that's really great feedback. That's kind of what we're looking for tonight. So that's very helpful. Um, just as an update, what we're planning to do is we have a few budget workshops coming up with the city council, one on March 31st, and then the other one I believe is May 15th or 14th. Um, and at that time we would be bringing uh, to them, um, asking for some money in the budget for a 30th anniversary event, such as one that you were just describing and um, if that gets approved and we have a, a budget for it, then the next steps would be um, moving forward with trying to plan that event and we would look for some assistance. So thank you. Yeah, question. Um, you mentioned a couple of dates for that budget meeting. Uh, I'm in receipt, as I think most of us are, of an email from the city clerk's office for a meeting on March 10th. Has that been changed? Uh, yes, uh, you're, you're stealing from my director's report thunder, but I will uh, mention that right okay. now. <laughs> um, 
There is. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's fine. I can I can talk to it now. Um, not a problem. Um, there is a special commission meeting for strategic planning on March 10th. And that's at 5.30 p.m., and you should have all received an invitation from the city clerk's office with regards to that. Um, that is separate from those two budget workshops I just mentioned. Those two budget workshops okay. are right. with the city council. Um, this workshop on the 10th is more of a strategic planning meeting um, where we are going to be looking to all the city commissioners for input uh, as we put together our new strategic planning document for the next two years. So that meeting will be gotcha. um, essentially right. where we'd be coming to you with uh, doing a full SWOT analysis on our, our city's um, mission, vision, values, um, and we'd be looking for impact, or excuse me, feedback from the commission at that time. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Appreciate that, Brett. So we'll move forward unless there's any additional comments um, on the uh, discussion items. We'll go right into director comments. Does staff have any comments at this time? Yes, I do. Thank you, Commissioner Shear. Um, so just as, a, again, a follow-up to that meeting on the 10th, um, it is going to be held uh, virtually, uh, what the way that we're, we're approaching is the chairs from all three commissions will be present here in the council chambers, and the rest of you have been invited to participate via uh, life size, which is essentially like a Zoom um, platform. And so, um, Chair Shear will be here representing the community services um, interest. However, it's still encouraged for everyone to be able to participate on the phone. Um, as part of that process. So uh, it's not the ideal situation. We would obviously prefer to have everyone here in the council chambers. It would make it go much smoother and, and would be a, mu a better meeting overall. However, we're uh, dealing with the, the times at hand. So that's the best that, that we can do for, for now. Um, so you are all invited and hope you can participate and that it's a, a helpful and productive meeting. Also, um, I wanted to announce that um, we are getting close to the red tier, uh, even though we are in the purple tier. And um, in terms of what that means for community services, it doesn't change a whole lot um, with the big news of youth and adult sports being able to play games um, early. That, that changed a lot. That wasn't going to be allowed to be happened until uh, the red tier, but that's been um, fast forwarded. So. Um, really, the, the uh, biggest change we might see in the community services realm with a move to the red tier would mean that um, some of those classes that have all had to be outdoors uh, would most likely be able to move indoors, um, which is what we did when we were in the red tier before. So just wanted to update you guys on that. And it would mean um, that our city council meetings and commission meetings would be open to the public once again um, with so appropriate social distancing and mask wearing. And then finally, um, a bit of sad news. Uh, for those of you that have, have been with the, this commission for a long time, obviously you would be familiar with Monique Villasenor. Uh, she's our senior recreation supervisor who has been overseeing the uh, community center. She is leaving us. Um, she's got, a, was a promotional job opportunity with the city of Costa Mesa as a recreation manager. Um, so it's a great opportunity for her. We're very excited for her, but it's a big loss for the city. Monique's been with us uh, for over 17 years. Mm. She was one of our first full-time recreation employees hired at the city, and she's worked at the, every facility. She's worked at the skate park, the sports park, and here at, at the Civic Center. So um, she'll definitely be missed. It's a big loss for us, but we're happy for her and, and wish her all the best. So just wanted to make sure you guys were aware of that. Thank you. Now we're at a time where we're moving on to commission member comments where each commissioner will choose what specific topic or any questions that they may have of the staff. We will start off with Commissioner Gold followed by Commissioner Heron. Right. Well, thank you guys for the update for the park and recreation. I appreciate that. I've worked, 
worked with both Ken and um, Bill, so appreciate the relationship we've had before and continue that with Little League. Other than that, I don't have any other comments. Thank you. Commissioner Heron. I believe Commissioner Heron did have to depart the meeting early, and she sent me her comments so that I can read them to you. Very good, thank you. you. Commissioner Heron participated in the pop-up City Hall at Portola Park on Saturday, February 27th. It was a great event. She received numerous compliments on Portola Park and our Lake Forest Parks in general. The comments and suggestions from that event are, electric bikes are being <laughs> driven on the grass, which is not good for the grass. Should we add that to our park rules? Can we put in mileage markers like at Concourse Park? Residents like to walk Portola Park and would appreciate these mileage markers. Two residents approached us about what kind of pesticides we're using at the parks. They like to see that we use organic pesticides like the city of Irvine. They cited the cancer cluster found in Irvine, which spurred the drive to organic pesticides. If you Google organic pesticides used in city of Irvine, you'll see several articles about it. Loretta, I'm sorry, Commissioner Heron would like to have the city switch to organic pesticides. <coughs> Commissioner Heron walked the sports park a few weeks ago and glad to see so many people using the park. There was a gazebo that had over 60 people that were not wearing masks, et cetera. The sports park staff knows which one it is. Perhaps we can post the COVID safety rules like at the playground areas in English and Spanish in the gazebos. Commissioner Heron's participating in our pen pal program. She was thrilled to receive her first postcard. She immediately wrote back and is looking forward to the next postcard. Commissioner Heron has a friend which posted on Facebook that her goal is to visit our 31 parks within 31 days of each month and get, it, get healthy doing it. Great way to promote our parks. And lastly, uh, the California's Association of Parks and Recreation Commissioners and Board Members is offering a virtual training session to present and discuss the roles and responsibilities of a commissioner or board member. It will be Saturday, March 20th at 9 a.m. via Zoom. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Metzl. Thank you, Chair Chair. First of all, I just want to comment, and I apologize for repeating myself, but Jonathan and Bill, Ken, Laura, Vicki, and Brett, uh, you know, this is, Lake Forest is kind of not a small city, it's not a big city. I, I came from a city in Colorado, Spring, Colorado Springs, that's where I'm from, uh, which was about 100,000 people, and pretty much there's only about 2 million people total in the state of Colorado because west of the Rockies, there's nobody lives there. So, uh, so I've lived in some bigger cities, but this is a, a very substantial size city, but it amazes me what you did before, the group of everybody, Brett, since coming on board, and um, but through this whole pandemic, how you have navigated and kept things going. Because I mean, I, I, for an example, I know that uh, pastor at my church had just gotten an executive uh, uh, pastor to help with 2020. He came in September 2020. And they mapped out a whole thing for the whole year, and then a couple months later, the pandemic came and everything went out the window. So they had to kind of regroup, and it's amazing how they had done it there to be sitting outside and just changing a lot of things. So um, I, I don't believe you can ever give too much kudos to people that are doing a great job. So thank you. And as you know, I've been involved in volunteer stuff for years. So I've seen your work kind of on the other side for a long time. And uh, Brett, you've been great since coming on board, and Jennifer, and uh, my uh, cohorts uh, here, um, Chair Share and Jim Rosenberg, who was just a phenomenal volunteer. So anyway, Thank you so much for that. And also, um, we talked about getting, I think, I think somebody to kind of, not a director, but um, em emissaries to look at different parks. But I've taken it upon myself. I live right up the road from Tamara, so I check by it every time. And it's thriving. It's coming back. And this kind of startup baseball games. And not to get anybody in trouble, but it's kind of always been a mini dog park, and they were not there for a long time. But all the people know each other, so I see all the dogs coming back, and on my jog around the trail, um, I see the dogs there. They're very friendly. So Tamarisk, just from my personal thing, if I can report on it, is alive and well, and 
basketball courts, and uh, the, it's really nice because there was never um, a handicap access before, and now there is, so I see a lot more people can get, that, get down in strollers as well as in wheelchairs. So anyway, Tamaris is alive and well. But anyway, thank you for everybody that uh, serves in the city of Lake Forest, to my fellow commissioners, welcome aboard Kelly, and uh, thank you guys all very much. That's all I have. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Rosenberg, followed by Chair Shear. Vice Chair Rosenberg. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I guess I'll start out by echoing uh, and, and saying, copy that on just about everything that Commissioner Matzel said. Um, I keep being totally amazed by the staff reports at our meetings now and the amount of effort and creativity that has gone into the fact that you hardly know that there was a pandemic happening, considering all the programs that they have going. Um, last week, I received uh, my virtual copy of the um, clubhouse calendar, and I was absolutely amazed by the amount of activity that is still going on and also the amount of participation. Um, we're truly, I think, serving our residents in a wonderful fashion, and I think kudos should go to literally everybody on the staff, whether they are at the senior director level or whether they are just somebody doing a job, so to speak. Um, I'm very, very proud of saying I'm a resident of Lake Forest when I see the results and the amount of effort that is being put into providing services um, for our for our population. And um, thank you to all that are involved in this. It's a great job, and you should all be very, very proud of, of what you're doing. Um, I, you know, we haven't missed a beat, whether it's the skate park, the sports park, special needs, uh, everything is still going in some form and fashion uh, that denotes a lot of effort being put into it and no segment of the community being left behind, for which, again, I'm just very proud to be a small part of that overall effort. Um, a couple of quick kind of comments, questions, statement, please don't let up. Please keep the pedal to the metal with what is being done. It's only going to get better. And um, I, I think we've made some great headway over the past year with putting programs out there for our people to participate in. Um, again, thank you all very, very much for everything you do. Um, just a hope that we can come to a decision on the 4th of July parade in the bottom of my heart. I'm hoping we can have it because it is such a great event um, for our city and so well attended and people look forward to it. But again, fully would understand if because of the conditions, people's health and safety should come first, that we take a buy on it and take a buy on some of the other events. Um, another thing that has kind of gone by the wayside, and it's a question, if the standards relax, would there be an opportunity to do our pet expo later in the year? Or should we just look at that and say 2022? That's kind of a question. Yeah, that's a, a good question. Um, but certainly... As we go through the budget here, uh, in the next couple months, we'll be discussing special events and what the city council is comfortable with putting a budget for. And um, for us, as, as you know, any special event takes months of planning. But if, if things work sure. to relax and um, we have money in the budget for a um, pet expo and we decide we'd rather do that in the fall than wait till the, the spring of 2022, that's something definitely we can consider if we, the money is there. Um, so I think it, it's a kind of all up in the air at the moment. 
Um, but when we come to the council here in the next few months for the budget adoption, uh, that will really be the, the telltale sign if, if we're going to have money available and budgeted for special events such as the Pet Expo. And then when it's going to happen, I think, will all depend on when uh, any guidance and regulations from the state and county. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Brett. Appreciate that. Thank you, Commissioner Rosenberg. I gave a lot of thought this evening for the comments that I want to make, and I am so excited when I received the leaflet in the mail that comes out, particularly the winter edition that recently was sent to our residents. Hopefully, all of us have had a chance to review it. It's by far a publication that is very impressive with the photography and the layout and the scheduling of events. My gosh, it's kind of like a directory of everything you need to know about the city. The front cover portrayed a photograph, color photograph of the church on the Heritage Hill Historical Park. And this uh, credit goes to Nick Gates, who provided the photo uh, for that. But the color photography, as you look through the, through the, uh, uh, the leaflet, is, is truly outstanding. And I think anyone who reads this will um, also agree how informative this particular publication it is. So I want to extend to the staff and uh, to those individuals that are responsible for the layout, the writing, the editing, thank you very much. It reflects uh, uh, off uh, the quality of, of, of our staff and reflects the character of us as a city. So thank you again very much. And hopefully we'll continue to add more things as time arises. And I think during this time uh, uh, of COVID, this fills a important void as far as keeping us informed. So again, thank you so much to staff and the editors of um, uh, the leaflet. I might like to ask a question as far if you can provide credits to those folks who actually work on this and what department generates the leaflet? Yeah, uh, that's a, a great suggestion. I, I believe we, at one point we had a page in there that did provide credits to the staff that yeah. worked on it. Um, but it is it is a joint effort. It's yeah. it's the whole management services department that puts it together. We have the community services uh, division that works on all the community services programs that you see listed, and then we have the PIO division um, led by Jonathan Volsky, who's here tonight, um, and and Nick Gates and Alan Reyes all work together on putting those articles together, um, writing them, and and the photography that you mentioned as well. So it's a it's a, a large team effort. Thank you, and uh, one last comment on Cherry Park. Um, I'm beginning feedback how impressive the playground equipment and the, the remake of Cherry Park. I, I, it will serve as an excellent model for future layouts of parks um, anywhere in Orange County. I don't think there's anything that will compare to the outstanding job that was done architecturally uh, the equipment that was provided, the color schemes, a lot of thought certainly went into this to make it very user friendly. And I get from time to time comments uh, from families of how appreciative they are uh, on this particular park. And there's more to come from other parks too. So we really are exciting times uh, to look forward to. Again, thank you, staff and those who contributed uh, to uh, the remake on, on many of our parks. I remember walking through the parks many years ago when, I, uh, when uh, as I was a commissioner, and we really looked very hard at what we can do to enhance the parks and visit with the local residents that live around the park. And all that input and feedback contributed to the final end product. Again, thank you very much. That concludes my comments. Uh, at this time, the meeting will be adjourned. Our next regular meeting is scheduled for April 7th, 
2021. I declare the meeting adjourned.